in the far left, your far left-hand corner is Dr. Vikas Parekh. He's a professor of medicine at U of M where he's the associate chief clinical officer for medical emergency and psychiatric services and system medical director for capacity management. In his capacity management role, Dr. Parekh has developed a modeling of COVID-19 cases in Michigan in order to better inform the U of M hospital system on how to react. Not only has he focused on Southeast Michigan, but he has developed models for every county in Michigan to ensure a complete picture. Dr. Marissa Eisenberg and Dr. Emily Martin are both associate professors of epidemiology in the School of Public Health. Dr. Eisenberg's work focuses on using and developing parameter estimations and identifiable techniques to connect math models and disease data. Dr. Martin's research has been related to clinical and molecular epidemiology of viral and bacterial diseases. Since the COVID-19 outbreak together, they have been working on gathering COVID data and utilizing the public health indicators to create dashboards and metrics for the state of Michigan. Finally, rounding off our panel is Dr. Rick Neitzel. Dr. Rick Neitzel is the Associate Chair of the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, Associate Professor of Global Public Health and Associate Professor of Environmental Health Sciences School in the School of Public Health. Dr. Neitzel has been working with industry and public health officials on best practices for returning to work. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the modeling uh, work that we've been doing. So we've been building forecasting models, short-term forecasting models at the county and regional and statewide levels. Um, but we've been doing a little bit of simulation just to look at um, scenarios for lifting social distancing as we start to re-engage and reopen and all of that kind of thing. Um, and so these are some um, some in progress, this is an in progress set of simulations I should emphasize first, um, that's looking at what happens as, as we begin to lift social distancing and over three different scenarios, over a one month period, a two month period, and a three month period where we go from the, the sort of full social distancing, which we're simulating a range of social distancing levels, but um, full social distancing in place to back to normal contact patterns. So I wanna emphasize that this is just a, a transition from social distancing back to normal contact patterns. Um, the, the models that we've been working on, so you can see here the data and the model fit to the data. This is for statewide, um, but we've been looking at this regionally as well. Um, and what you can see is that um, there's a, a large range of uncertainty first off. So each of these shaded regions represents one of the three scenarios over here. Um, there's a large range of uncertainty um, and it, it ranges from not seeing a resurgence at all to possibly seeing something fairly big. Um, that's not to say that you know, anyone that this is what the model is predicting, it's this full range. So it's essentially saying we can't rule out a resurgence, but it's not necessarily saying that that's what would happen. It's just, you know, that's the range. Um, and so uh, in these simulations, basically what you can see is that the the slower that you, you sort of ramp things down, um, you know, that essentially if you ramp things down over three months in a sort of staged kind of slow way, then um, you you flatten the curve more. You tend to have less chance, less sort of um, overall height or or you know sort of range of resurgence, um, and and it tends to be sort of more of a flattened curve that is a little bit slower as well. Um, so so that's uh, some just some preliminary results that I thought folks might find interesting. To the hospital and health system perspective. We'll look at some uh, areas. So this is really the Detroit Metro Tri-County area, which was the hotspot. Um, at the peak, uh, we had about 3,500 patients hospitalized with COVID-19. That was really one out of every three beds in the region was then occupied by a COVID-19 patient. Um, the good news is over time, that number has come down dramatically. Um, over here, we kind of show our projection Numbers are down 60% from the peak. So the health system now has significant capacity and has recovered. And we anticipate a continued decline, although probably much slower than what we've seen over the past month. Um, Genesee County was another county that was um, hit fairly hard. Um, again, has a nice trend of uh, rapid drop in hospitalizations. And again, we expect this to continue. Um, and so these health systems are now in recovery mode as well. Um, 
And the last area we were watching is really um, Kent, Muskegon, and Ottawa in the western part of the state. This is the only place where hospitalizations continue to grow. Um, as Dr. Eisenberg alluded to, Kent County and surrounding counties um, had a lot of cases, uh, especially in the last several weeks, um, which is driving some of this growth. The good news is our, our modeling suggests we're getting close to peak here, um, and the rate of rise has really kind of slowed down. Um, it's worth noting that in Kent County, in these areas, the rate of hospitalization is actually much lower than in the rest of the state. So even though those confirmed case numbers are quite large, the percent of those patients who end up getting hospitalized is actually quite low. So that may reflect patterns of testing or the population that is being infected is um, younger and healthier and less likely to be hospitalized. There's been a lot of discussion of this idea of using data and using an understanding of not only where we are, but where we think we're going to inform decisions in moving forward and re-engaging sectors of our economy. Um, one of the things um, so that, that I wanted to talk about is, is what, what data, what are we actually talking about when we talk about using data to make these decisions and to have a conversation about what the risk is um, in different communities at different levels. I think one thing that's been really surprising about this epidemic from my perspective has been the fact that, um, that uh, one second. There we go. Um, has been the, the fact that this has been um, a, a very regional epidemic, that um, states and even at the county level, as Dr. Preck mentioned, have had very different experiences to date in the epidemic. Um, and so the decision making and the numbers in these different places look very different. And so I wanted to talk a bit about how we think about this. And so this is just an example of moving between phases. I've sort of borrowed from the state plan that came out yesterday. Uh, on the, the terminology about different phases. But um, on a regional level, well, what we really advise is, is um, a wise path forward. And this is actually in tandem with a lot of other state plans, a lot of guidance that we've gotten from the CDC as well, that um, you look to see whether your regional disease trends are improving, which is actually kind of a vague statement for a very specific couple uh, set of questions that I'll, I'll talk through in more detail in a second. Um, you look to see if regional disease trends are improving, and you also examine the epidemiologic context on the ground. So a simple kind of a curve or a line downwards will sometimes mask problems, either, either that um, the situation on the ground is, is better than one could expect using the numbers or worse than one could expect using the numbers, based on what's actually going on and, and what local hospitals, what local public health professionals will tell you. When we look at workplaces, especially in a state with as diverse an industrial base as Michigan, we want to think about, well, what are the characteristics about workplaces that might make them more or less uh, at risk of having uh, an outbreak or uh, transmission of the virus? And so in looking at this, we've basically distilled this down to eight factors here, and you can see these displayed as worker interaction and workplace workplace characteristics. So these are, again, characteristics that we can look at that we feel are directly linked to the risk of someone either coming into contact with um, an infected person or uh, working in high density with people that we don't necessarily know are infection free. So I'll run through these factors here. You can see um, many of these are ones that would come to mind intuitively for you, things like interaction with the general public, how close you are uh, in terms of physical proximity to coworkers, whether you share tools, machinery, or equipment. Uh, are you required to travel to many different workplaces? What's the density of workers present? You know, are you off working all by yourself or are you in a, a group of workers inherently due to the work that you're doing? Is it indoor versus outdoor work? What are the conditions and airflow in the building? And finally, what's the availability of sanitation facilities? So those are aspects about work that we can look at uh, in an objective manner. We also though know that there are certain uh, types of work who may be at increased risk as well. So we have to worry about things like demographics, uh, pre-existing health conditions, um, exposure outside of the workplace to infected individuals, how people get to and from work, and immunity as well. 
So we need to acknowledge that individual workers and their personal characteristics may increase or decrease their risk. But what we have focused on primarily here has been these uh, more workplace and work type characteristics. Again, I want to just offer a sincere thank you to our panelists for taking the time to engage with the Wolverine Caucus and, and, and the members of the legislature, as well as uh, members around the University of Michigan community.